Hey, howdy. Hey, my Bruin brothers and sisters. Greetings, greetings. <laughs> good to uh, see you all. Good to, uh, I mean, the only people we see is you. And me. Yeah, that's true. But, so uh, you mean y'all, you mean me? Y'all and, and the other people that are very vicariously there with you as well. Yes. Yes. That would be, that would be nice. That'd yeah. Be nice. Very nice. Very nice. Um, Is Heretic hopping these days? Lots of, lots of walk-in customers or? We are, we are, we are hopping. If by hopping you mean, uh, are we? uh, Dry hopping, yeah. Yeah, are we hopping our beers? Yes. Yes, we definitely are hopping, so to speak. Uh, How's things down at the, uh, at the Palmer Refuge? Did you get your deck finished? No, no. I'm. I guess I'm. I would say I'm probably sixty percent done. Um, well, just like the election, you're about sixty percent done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, metaphors aside, it's it's coming along pretty well. <laughs> good. Nice to hear. Yeah. I'm getting your. It, uh... It's uh, you know, it's 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 always a process. As soon as you take apart one you know aspect like the stairs for example mm-hmm. you find wood underneath the stairs that needs to be replaced it's like hey, yeah. i gotta do this first and then i'll come back and do this and it takes long always takes longer much longer than you figured that's a fact that's a fact yeah. anytime you start cracking open anything in your house there's a whole another nest of, of god knows what to be taken care of yeah, that's for sure Similar speaking, to, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> similar to speaking of, of God knows what or a nest. <laughs> we were thinking the same thing. <laughs> you thinking of our good friend John Blickman? Yes, indeed. There, there is a can of worms. There, where or a a mind in in search of a problem. There's there's a address. mind that is. Are you are, are you saying John Blickman's mind? Is equivalent to a can of worms. Lots of activity. Yes. Yes. Very much. Lots of lots of squishy bits. I imagine. Yeah. If you were to yes. crack open his skull, it would be feel very much like a can of worms. I would imagine. I imagine so. Yeah. I have not felt. Uh, well, no. I I take that back. I have felt brains before. So uh, yeah, they don't really feel like a can of worms. Uh, but you know, um, there you go. I yeah. suppose. Uh, I but suppose. he is always thinking of new uh, problems to address, new yes. inventions to solve these problems and yes. make your brew day easier. So yes. that's why we like him, among other things. And he's just a hell of a guy. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I, the, the wonderful Mr. John Blickman and uh, Blickman Engineering has been paying for this show, so you don't have to, for, oh, these many decades. Yes. So uh, the very least you can do is check out BlakemanEngineering.com, uh, all the cool stuff there. And next time you're down at your homebrew shop, when they get they probably uh, have some Blickman gear there. Check it out. Uh, see see what stuff they got there, and uh, you know maybe send a nice email to uh, John uh, feedback at BlakemanEngineering.com. Tell him how much you enjoy the show, and uh, you appreciate that he's paying for it. And that way. Uh, Mr. Palmer and I get to continue doing these things. We wouldn't see each other if it wasn't for the show. <laughs> that's, that's almost, that is that is quite true. Um, you know, considering how much time we we have hung out, I think uh, you know we've we've certainly spent a lot more time together uh, virtually, yeah. shall we say? Um, yeah. Yeah. It. it uh, our our schedule these schedules these days makes it difficult to actually get yes. together a person in person. But uh, yes. our love is no less for for the distance. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, today uh, we were going to talk about. Uh, stratification in uh, fermentation. So one of the interesting things is that uh, 
you know, especially in commercial brewing, when you'll have larger tanks, you will do multi batches into a tank to fill them. And generally you pitch your yeast on the first batch and then you fill it up the rest of the way. And then filling it up the rest of the way can take the rest of the day. It can take a couple of days, depending on the, the size of the tank and the size of your, your, your brew plant. And uh, for us here at Heretic, uh, you know, we have tanks that take four turns of the, of the brew plant to fill up. Wow. And depending on the day, sometimes that's all done in one day. Sometimes that's done, you know, a couple of batches one day, a couple of batches the next day. And what's interesting is that it is possible for there to be a, um, a stratification of the words and for the two beers to essentially ferment separately. And uh, John has a ton of in interesting information about this uh, based on some uh, work that was done by uh, Dave Caprell. There you go. So uh, why don't you uh, start off, John, by telling us, you know, what is it? What, what is this problem? Okay. Well, you outlined it quite well. Um, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, stratified fermentation is two separate, at least two, uh, and distinct fermentations occurring in the same vessel at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, these two fermentations are typically layered, one on top of the other, and separated by a boundary zone. And these fermentations will have different densities and or different temperatures and or different cell counts because they are occurring separately. Mm -hmm. And then later on, these two fermentations will eventually merge turbulently into a third homogeneous fermentation that generally doesn't meet this, the normal specification for that beer. Mm -hmm. So it is, um, it's a, a very interesting problem that typically only affects commercial brewers where they're doing uh, multiple brews to fill a fermenter doesn't happen really at the homebrew level. Uh, even if you're using, doing two brews to fill a fermenter, the scale of our fermentations, you know, five, 10 gallons is small enough that you usually don't get stratification. I would imagine it's, it's a, there's a potential problem for it even on the homebrew scale because I've come across homebrewers that have like one barrel fermenters and well, they will brew, you know, they'll have a 10 barrel, you know, or 10 gallon uh, brew, brew kit and they'll brew into it three times and they'll do very similar to what they see commercial brewers doing, which is pumping in the bottom. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the thought being, well, pumping it in the bottom, it, it, it must stir it up and, and mix it. Uh, you know, how, how is it possible that it's not, uh, you know, so why exactly is this occurring? Well, it is, it's occurring one, because as we said, it multiple brews to fill that larger fermenter. And it occurs uh, primarily because there is a lack of mixing of the two words. Mm -hmm. So um, now there, there are a number of factors that promote the, the incidence of stratification. It doesn't always happen, but it can. And these factors uh, are, one, the addition of a fresh, unyeasted wort to an active fermentation. Um, and you do that when you add all of your yeast to your, your first uh, brew in the multi-brew fermenter. If there is a low fill velocity of the second or third worts, uh, you, t you can get, and depending on the geometry of the fermenter, you can get uh, essentially all of the initial wort and the initial fermentation raising up as it is slowly displaced from the bottom, um, creating these two distinct layers. Now, this the it is often the case that um, the initial fermentation is a couple of degrees warmer, and uh, you know depending on the amount of time that has gone by. It could be a couple, you know, uh, gravity points lower in density. So all, both of these things help um, dis allow that cooler uh, 
heavier wort to displace and move the first wort without actually mixing in, especially if that mm-hmm. fill velocity is slow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. You know, the, uh, uh, when we're doing multiple batches, you know, as perfect a brewery as we are, <laughs> right. There's times when, you know, you may be knocking out the second batch and it's, you know, going a little slower or colder. And, and if it's going slower for some reason, uh, it tends to be colder because it's if, in the you're, heat if you're not order. adjusting everything else on your, your heat exchanger and your, your cooling method, um, you'll end up with cooler wort, but you know, like, well, that's okay. You know, not a big deal. A couple of degrees, it'll blend together. It'll be fine. And then what you don't realize is that you're setting yourself up with this problem. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's take a short break. And when we come back, we'll have uh, more about stratification and fermentation right after this. All right, we're back. We're talking about uh, stratified fermentation, which you wouldn't think would be as much of an issue as it is. But uh, what I can tell you is we've actually experienced that problem here at Heretic. Ah. And, you know, we didn't know what it was. Uh, but what we noticed was um, on some fermenters, you know, just kind of randomly, and it, it tend, tended to be after, um, you know, first my guys were like, no, 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 the, the solenoids are sticking open. We have uh, motorized ball valves uh, that open and close to, to run the glycol valve. They're like, that, you know, that's not working. And it's sticking open and, you know, it's chilling down the, 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 the beer, you know, just randomly overnight. And uh, I'm like, well, that's not happening because I see the, the, the ball valves are, are operating. If they get stuck, you know, they get stuck. They burn out. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the other thought was, okay, well, maybe it's, you know, a problem with the sensor. They're like, the sensors are off. And, you know, so we check the, you know, with a, with a, you know, another probe, we check various points. We're like, no, you know, the, the, the sensor's on, everything's, uh, uh, everything's good. So, uh, you know, with that, we're like, you know, what pattern? So I'm like, look, we need to write down every bit of information, you know, about this. What's happening? What tanks? What time? You know, what beer was in there? And what we started to learn was it was when we were filling the tanks all the way up. If we, you know, had, you know, just a couple of batches in there, um, no problem. When we filled them all the way up, then we started getting an issue. And uh-huh. like, well, it's because of this, that. I'm like, nah, you know, it has something to do with, and, you know, we, we figured out, you know, it's got to be something with the mixing. And, but what we experienced was, um, you know, all of a sudden the fermentation, the beer would drop. So the probe it tends to be on the bottom part of the tanks. That's yeah. how everybody sets up their tanks. Because if you're not filling it all the way, but you don't have to, you need that probe, you know, covered. And so you tend to put the probe in the lower half or the lower third of the tank with the thought being that everything's mixed nicely. And so doesn't matter, you know, and fermentation will mix it up and it'll yeah. keep it nice and mixed because there's a lot of activity. If you've ever looked at a carboy, fast carboy, you see how turbulent a fermentation is. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, brewers rely upon that. And I had never been, you know, this is, this has been discovered, you know, 10 plus years ago, right? 12 years right. ago, this paper was written. And uh, I had never heard of this. I had never been told this. Um, you know, I'd never heard of it from any other brewer. And so, um, you know, we kind of came to it ourselves. We're like, wow, you know, this is, this has got to be what's happening. And uh, it will also impact uh, the yeast yeah. and, you know, the total fermentation. Sometimes you get, you know, and that's one of the things I wonder about this, if it, it, it's also possibly, uh, you know, strain related in a way. Other certain strains, you know, are more likely to experience this or not? It, it seems likely. 
Uh, I don't know. That's that's a really good question. Well, how exactly is this occurring? What's what okay. what is happening here? You know, outline it for us in your engineering way that uh, <laughs> you know, we, we get a vision of exactly what's happening inside that tank we can't see into. Sure. Well, uh, I should. I might as well preface this and say that the majority of the information for today's show comes from a Master Brewers technical quarterly article uh, titled "Stratified Fermentation: Causes and Corrective Actions" by David Caprell, and this was published in Volume Forty Five, Number Two, from two thousand eight. So that being said, he outlines five stages. Uh, of the stratified fermentation that uh, occur. And I think this helps lay it out pretty well. In stage one, we are uh, adding the new wort. And this new wort displaces the actively fermenting wort instead of mixing with it. So so you've already, uh, for, we'll use for example at Heretic, we've got these uh, 120 barrel net, they are 147 barrels gross. Our brew plant puts out about 37 barrels per turn. Uh, so we get in cold into the fermenter, maybe 32 barrels. We put the first batch in there and add the yeast. And then, you know, some four hours later, we add another batch. And then we add another batch. And then we add another batch. Okay. Until the thing's full. So you're saying, you know, we've, we've added that first batch. And in a lot of breweries, it's very common to not be able to turn as quickly yeah, and, and as we do here, especially if you're like a two vessel brewery. And um, I've encouraged a lot of my friends to put in multi-size tanks. Sorry if I go off on a tangent here, No worries. but I've, I've encouraged a lot of my friends to put in multi uh, size tanks, you know, because, you know, when you're starting out, uh, you could brew, you know, one batch, let's say you have a 15 barrel brewery. Mm-hmm. you know, buy 30 barrel or 45 barrel fermenters because you could brew a 15 into there while, when, you know, you're getting started. And then all, you know, when all of a sudden people want a ton of that beer, you could double batch into it. And, you know, it generally takes the same amount of space. It generally just costs a little bit more money to get the larger tank, which pays for itself. And, you know, after you use it once. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I've encouraged them to do that, but a lot of them will have just, you know, two vessel brew plants where it's just the, the mash, uh, mash louder, com- combi mash louder and combi kettle whirlpool. And so it's difficult for them to do two turns in a day. Yeah. And for us, we have four vessels so we can mash while the louder is full and, you know, and the louder is going into the kettle and then, you know, you know, as it's going to the whirlpool, the mash goes into the louder. So it uh, cuts the amount of time it takes to turn another batch because we can be doing other things while, while, uh, while we're in that process. Anyways, so on these breweries with just two, two vessels uh, and double batching, they'll usually batch the second day to fill that tank. Okay. And in that second day, we know what happens when, you know, they're all, you know, all my friends are pitching good amounts of yeast, healthy yeast. They're getting fermentation going. You know, the growth is there. It's already started fermenting and they're pumping that next wort. It's already dropped several degrees Plato probably. Um, you know, the, just having the yeast present changes the, you know, osmotic gradient of the liquid, right? Right. And it's probably warmer than what they're pumping in. Yep. Yeah. So anyways, you're talking about <laughs> the first thing is adding yeah. cold wort underneath the, uh, the actively fermenting wort. Yes. Okay. Okay. And that's what exactly as you described perfectly, it's it's displacing it instead of mixing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so now the other thing that happens is that this new wort picks up a low cell count from interaction with the active actively mm-hmm. fermenting wort. Um, something on the order of only about 5 million cells per milliliter um, it, you know, cell count, which is low. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, you know, after 12 hours, you'd be looking for something in the 20 to 40 million cells per mil range. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and 
this this new low cell count fermentation is occupying the bottom part of the fermenter where it covers that temperature probe and sampling port. So uh, you don't, I mean, you're measuring this, this second fermentation now when you do samples. And then there is this uh, a stratification boundary zone that is separating the two fermentations, kind of like a, you know, uh, the uh, no man's land or boundary layer that is uh, uh, the uh, division. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, salt water and fresh water. You know, there's like a right. halocline where it'll, it'll, uh, uh, you know, one will sit on top of the other, uh, and won't, won't mix. Yeah. I mean, you get a little fuzzy layer there, but, um, you know, it, it's because the two have different densities, they will not mix. And, and even just temperature alone can cause that, you know, if you ever seen, uh, you know, black and tan. Oh Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a good example of, of what's happening. Yeah, that's a very good, good example. Okay, so we've done stage one. We've we've created this uh, two this stratified fermentation. Mm -hmm. Now, in stage two, these two warts will ferment separately for a period of time, approximately eighteen to thirty hours after fermenter full or after that last uh, in our, or uh, what do you call it in our infusion. There you mm -hmm. go. Um, so the, remember the bottom layer is what's covering the probe and driving the cooling system. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that lower fermentation is what's driving the system. Um, and it therefore drives how long those fermentations are going to remain separate. Um, we tend to have that, that lower, uh, fermentation tends to be a little bit cool. It tends to ferment slowly because of the ferment, the fermentation, uh, sorry, the, the yeast cell count. So only a small amount of cooling is necessary to maintain your set, your set temperature. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows the upper layer to kind of run away. Um, right. That upper layer is now, it has been actively fermenting. There's not much cooling being applied to the tank. It's fermenting and, hot. Yeah, it's, it gets exothermic. And it, actually, its temperature gets to be about three to five degrees Fahrenheit above the set point. Mm -hmm. So it's fermenting quite well, really dropping in density. And not at all the way you want it to happen. You know, yeah. Yeah. temperature control is critical to beer flavor, the proper yeah. fermentation. Yeah. So now, you know, this, this goes on, stage two goes on for 18 to 30 hours approximately. And this, and these numbers come from a couple of lager fermentations and a couple of ale fermentations. Um, limited data set, but you, you can probably chime in as far as what seems typical for you all. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, about 18, 18 to 30 hours. Then the event occurs. The two fermentations mix. And the, and the way this happens is that the cell count in the lower fermentation reaches about 18 to 20 million cells per mil, um, where, you know, versus the normal count of, say, 50 to 75 in this period of time. Um, the upper fermentation, which has been just going along full speed ahead, has started to slow. And it now is now less exothermic and the fermenter cooling starts to catch up with it. Mm -hmm. And with the result that it can actually cool to two to three degrees below the set point. I've, I've seen even more than that. Really? Okay. Yeah. So you, yeah. So you've got, you've got a lower layer, you know, a bottom layer that's at the set point. Now you've got an upper layer that's cooled several degrees below this set point. Mm -hmm. um, and that yeast activity is slowing down. A little bit of flocculation is starting to happen. Um, and now you're getting the CO2 evolution on the bottom layer starting to cause more turbulence. And we enter the event, the turbulent mixing of these two layers. 
um, you'll often, as a brewer, you'll often see a sudden change or increase in the carbon dioxide as this occurs as well, um, due to all this mixing. All right, big bursts of CO2, violent activity all of a sudden, sure. Okay, then we enter stage four, the problem fermenter. You know, often this, you know, that, that uh, burp will happen overnight. You know, you come in the next day, you check everything, and, hmm, you know, gravity is not where you thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like it's, the fermentation is a little slow. Um, this mixing often drives the temperature of the fermentation a degree or three below the set point as well. So you look at this fermenter and say, hmm, it's fermenting a little bit cold. I'm going to turn the glycol down or raise the temperature, you know, decrease the cooling. Um, this seems to be going a little bit slow. Um, and the, the fermentation is homogenous at this point. Mm -hmm. But due to the low cell count in the bottom mm -hmm. and the rather aged cell count, if you will, at the top, we're at a net low cell count for the fermentation at mm -hmm. this point in time. Yeah. So it is a problem fermentation. Yeah, you don't have enough cells to really properly carry the fermentation all the way through. You may see lower attenuation. You may see longer ferments. You'll see different flavor development. You'll see uh, yeah. a lot of little problems with this. And, and it could be, uh, you know, increased uh, acetaldehyde, acetal, you know, a number of things, you know, uh, that, that could happen from this. And so this is the problem fermenter, but obviously this has some impact on the yeast as well. If yeah. you're harvesting this yeast and you're carrying this forward, what, what happens then? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's the stage five of stratified fermentation. The, and this is, you know, poor harvested yeast, you know, normally your day-to-day -day routine, you brew, you ferment, you harvest, you get ready to pitch to the next brew um, and next fermenter, and you just keep turning this over. You've got a number of turns per week or day that you plan to have. Right. Now you've got this slow fermenter that's not harvesting the same quantity of yeast that you're used to, kind of throws a wrench in the works. And what's also interesting about this harvested yeast is that its vitality and viability is greatly reduced, um, even by half from mm -hmm. what a normal fermentation would be, which I'm sure is a real pain in the ass for you. That's Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this harvested yeast, yeast, when you do repitch it, due to its lower vitality, can take an extra six, eight to 16 hours to ferment the subsequent batch. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a subsequent fermentation that's also impacted right. by this previous fermentation. And then, um, and then you start thinking, oh, this pitch is bad, or, you know, yeah. maybe, you know, I've got a bad pitch from the uh, supplier, or maybe, you know, this is somewhere down the road and you're thinking, oh, you know, yeah, we're having problems with this yeast time to repitch. Yeah, yeah. You you think of all the usual suspects when it comes to a sluggish fermentation, you mm -hmm. know, temperature, yeast health, and this and that, when really the cause was the stratification mm -hmm. uh, that had occurred in the previous batch and then and how it affects the yeast, which I think is a really interesting uh, realization for many people, um, you know, that as a brewery, you're probably used to experiencing this from time to time and you just chalk it up to, you know, variability. But once you understand where the cause is, uh, then you can stop cursing your supplier <laughs> and say, hmm, I, we need to be more careful on our fills and this will go away. Right. No more, damn you, White Labs. <laughs> Chris White. Yeah. Oh my God! No, no more that. Right I, I'll, I'll, I'll miss that. Oh, yeah. That's part of yeah. part of the entertainment for my day. That's right. Yeah, always helps to have have a cause to blame. Yeah, I gotta blame somebody. Yep. You know it's not me. It can't be. How's that possible? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> You've got a track record. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's right. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah no, I, you know, I find this fascinating and, you know, I, I think it, uh, you know, it explains a lot of things uh, that, uh, you know, I've seen over the years, including, um, you know, uh, there was, uh, you know, an instance where, I think somebody was, uh, you know, brewing a, you know, multiple batch, you know, of mm -hmm. high gravity beer over multiple days. And they wanted a pitch of yeast from us. We give them a pitch of yeast. And then they're just like, well, you know, it didn't turn out very well. Uh -huh. It's like, you know, it was the yeast you gave me. It's like, oh, you know, I wonder if, you know, again, they had this stratification issue because, yeah. you know, we were using the same pitch of yeast and we didn't have any problems at all. And we're like, you know, what was the issue? And of course, right. uh, you know, again, they needed somebody to blame. And of course it <laughs> must be us, because, yeah. you know, we must have not given them the good yeast. We must have given them the bad yeast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I wouldn't do that to somebody. Um, and, you know, generally if yeast isn't good for fermentation, you're, you're dumping it anyways, you know, you don't hold on to bad yeast. It's not like right. we're in the Vegemite business or anything. Right. All right. Uh, one more short break. Uh, when we come back, we'll have more on the uh, stratified uh, fermentation plus uh, answers to some of the live questions after this. All right, we're back. We're talking uh, stratification and fermentation. And, and I do believe that, you know, there are some homebrewers out there that are experiencing, you know, something similar to this. I, that you know, could be, um, yeah. I remember filling up, uh, you know, barrels, large, uh, you know, yeah. uh, wood barrels with beer as well. And uh, I imagine you can have a similar problem go on in that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating how, how important the mixing is. Uh, and, and others who have had uh, trouble with um, multi-batch uh, fermentation in the past, a lot of brewers, they're like, oh, you know, that doesn't work. You know, I, I've had problems with that. And they think it's, you know, their pitch of yeast or they think it's, you know, they blame aeration it on a lot or, of different, yeah, yeah, a lot of different problems. And, uh, you know, this is much more likely, I think, because especially, um, you know, when you're, uh, you know, trying to do this on a commercial scale and, you know, sometimes you, for, for some breweries, their flow out of their heat exchanger uh, is, you know, fairly slow and it'll oh. take them a couple hours to knock out. Okay. And, uh, you know, we're, we're lucky that we set it up here so we can knock out, you know, a barrel a minute. And, um, you know, because we set up cold liquor and, you know, the heat exchanger is sized right and we're able to, to hammer out, you know, barrel a minute. We could do two barrels a minute, but, uh, go slower in order to get enough oxygen in there. Uh, but there are times when, you know, somebody slows it down for one reason or another, maybe there's a lot of material in the whirlpool and they want it to settle. And, you know, uh, it, it's the subtle little things in brewing that make such a big difference in the end yeah. product. And people don't really realize that it's like, eh, you know, that one little thing you're doing, that's the yeah. thing. Yeah. I, I have a, presentation I frequently give on maturation and it harkens back to what Dr. Lewis told us in San Diego at CBC many years ago and that is every time you change a factor in your mm -hmm. fermentation you've brewed a different beer mm -hmm. you had to brew the same beer you got to have the same fermentation and so this stratified fermentation is different produces a different beer mm -hmm. absolutely yeah that is it is, uh, you know, fascinating. Uh, you know, I think uh, there's so many topics like this that, you know, and, and a lot of us went from home brewing into commercial brewing and uh, didn't go to commercial brewing school and, you know, relied on the things that we could learn or the things we could learn from others. Yeah. Uh, and it becomes, uh, you know, quite difficult. And, these are very real problems that uh, exist. I think, you know, the MBAA um, is a great membership to have. There's such a yeah. wealth of information. I mean, if you have a problem, you can actually search the archives 
and find, you know, papers written, you know, 30 years ago, 50 years ago that yeah. actually address the very problem you're having. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's, it's well worth the money. Yeah. So I, I have to agree. That's, well, I'm, I'm a member, um, a member of the MBA, and I'm also the editor of the journal, which mm -hmm. allows me to see a lot of these articles as they're mm -hmm. published. Um, but yeah, it really is a, a really deep resource of information. Um, right. And the district memberships, um, if you go to the district meetings, you know, they're like a brewing guild uh, every month or whenever they have the district meetings, sometimes it's monthly, sometimes it's quarterly. Um, you're, you know, uh, talking with other professional brewers like yourself, um, well, and regardless of scale, you all are often seeing the same kinds of issues and can teach one another and learn from one another. So it really is a great resource uh, for people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where, that's where I found this article uh, on stratification mm -hmm. that we're talking today. Mm -hmm. So I guess so we should kind of get around to how do we fix a stratified right, right. that's what i was going to ask is you know is there a simple solution to this other than you know a giant spoon and <laughs> turn it up a paddle yeah mixing is the key the key mm -hmm. is sufficient mixing mm -hmm. um homebrew scale yeah you've got your got your spoon or your mash paddle or whatever that you can reach in there stir that word around in the fermenter and get everything homogenous. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to uh, very large tanks, such as, such as what you have, um, you know, you often have your, your inlet port um, where you're pumping in the wort from the bottom of the fermenter. Um, depending on uh, how full that fermenter is, how much mm -hmm. back pressure there is, uh, how strong the pump is, you know, that, and that, that wort velocity is going to vary. And when you have a very slow fill, that's when you don't get sufficient mixing. Mm -hmm. um, so one solution is to buy a stronger pump um, or configure the nozzle such that it puts out more velocity. Um, in one scenario outlined in the article, um, the the uh, fermenter was being filled through the racking port and that racking tube pointed down towards the cone. Mm -hmm. Well, to fix, to address the issue, they turned it up to about a 10, 10 o'clock position and that directed the incoming wort up and around the vessel and aided the mixing of those two worts. And they, they, they were able to correct the problem that way, simply mm -hmm. rotating the racking port. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to address the issue. Um, you could install sensors, both top and bottom, so mm -hmm. that you know that, hey, my temperature at the top is different from the temperature at the bottom. We might have stratification and need to take steps. Um, well, and I think, you know, for, for uh, the author, and, and, and this was at uh, Anheuser-Busch in uh, Idaho, I think, you know, they collect their wort in a, in a settling tank first and then pump it out of there into the fermenter. They're letting troube and all that drop out. Oh, yeah. They, they pump it over. So they were able to increase the velocity of their transfer. Uh, whereas most, you know, craft brewers our size or smaller, um, we tend to go right out of the heat exchanger into the tank. Okay. There is no intermediary vessel. Okay. And because of that, we're limited in how fast we can transfer because it's limited by the heat exchanger, just the throughput of the heat exchanger. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the chilling uh, available. So, uh, you know, for us, I think it's, you know, far more critical to, you know, hook up to the racking arm because a lot of folks will go in through the bottom port, which is just straight up the middle on the bottom. I think if you're pumping fast enough, yeah, you could get some good mixing, but, uh, you know, hooking up to the racking arm and then, you know, uh, going off at an angle. So it, it shoots up the side wall. Um, you know, that, yeah. that could be, that could be real advantageous, I think. Yeah. Is there a way, and um, I, I know when people talk about dry hopping and agitating the beer, 
you know, what to dry hop when they dry hop. Is there a way to circulate the wort in the fermenter um, after it's full? Yeah. So one of the things that's being done nowadays, it's actually become quite common is um, recirculating your wort, your beer uh, through a hop bed or through a hop, hop gun, hop cannon, uh, something, you know, a torpedo or yeah. whatever. So uh, you're, you're pulling the wort out or the beer out through, uh, you know, maybe the bottom port or off, the, off of one of the ports up the wall or the racking arm. And then you put it back in, you know, higher up and get a mixing of your hops. Uh, so that's happening with, you know, hops with various ingredients, uh, fruit and, you know, spices and things like that in order to fully extract uh, that. And so that gives a lot of agitation mixing as well, but it tends to be done uh, later in the process yeah. towards the end of fermentation or after fermentation is done. It certainly could be done beforehand, uh, yeah. but it's not something anybody, you know, does. sees a need to do. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably if, if those kinds of recirculation systems are becoming more common, that's probably the easiest way to address it mm -hmm. is when you just say when, okay, we're doing a multiple fill uh, after the, after each turn, we'll run the recirculation a little bit, make sure it's mixed and, and right. you know, that should address it. Well, and that's one of the things the author was talking about, uh, you know, maybe, you know, uh, fermenter manufacturers, uh, you know, could design something or construct equipment that has, um, you know, better, uh, you know, or some sort of solution. It has to yeah. our, like, our tanks, you know, they tended to come with, um, you know, four, you know, temperature probes, one for every jacket up the side. And we're always like, you know, it's, we, in a lot of cases have had them removed because uh, it really just uh, adds another shadow in the cleaning. Every, every, everything that oh, okay. in, the, in the fermenter, yeah. uh, you know, when you're sp spraying from above to clean the, the walls of the fermenter, it creates a shadow and underneath that, is you know all your protein and scum is going to build up and so you're trying to clean uh yeah know, worried about shadows so you don't want the uh, a bunch of probes sticking in the in the tank that way so you know there you go uh yeah, yeah I, they were also talking about you know doing sensors from above and they again they didn't have the ability to just cut open the tank and stick extra probes in yeah. so i'm sure what they did was they went to one of the top ports and did their instrumentation from there. And you right. could, you know, drop things down from the top into, you know, to check. Um, on the tanks that we do have multiple um, uh, temperature sensors, te temperature ports up the side, uh, we were thinking we, you know, could set. Uh, and, and we did when we experienced this problem, we, um, uh, put in, you know, temperature probes up at the top and, you know, middle and bottom problem is, you know, wasn't the same tank. We thought, Oh, you know, maybe, you know, it's oh. this tank. My guys were like, Oh, you know, it's gotta be this tank or, you know, this tank, but it just happened all over the place, you know, just randomly. It wouldn't happen that often, but every once in a while, it would just like pop up. Yeah. Like, well, why? And, um, you know, part of it's temperature related you know, the, the seasonal temperature variations. Right. And then the other question was, well, why are we um, experiencing, um, you know, such a, a large drop in temperature, you know, and part of my thinking is, you know, we keep our glycol quite cold, you know, we're, we're around 28, 29 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And a lot of other, uh, uh, places, you know, when they're, you know, they'll have glycol kept warmer for fermentation purposes, and then they'll have glycol that's kept really cold for, you know, packaging purposes. You know, something, something oh. like a or bush facility may have two different temperatures of glycol. So maybe they don't experience this large drop when something like this happens. One of my other thoughts was, 
I wonder if it would be possible to um, just vary the speed at which you are pumping in and cause that would cause some mixing. I mean, one of the things that happens, um, you know, when you're cleaning a keg is they vary the speed of the pump and that allows for, you know, to more dispersal of your, your cleaning uh, solutions. Oh yeah. And, you know, I, I wonder if the same thing might happen, you know, in, uh, you know, the, the fermenter. I still think the best bet is to go through the racking arm and angle off to the side. Yeah. You know, that to run up the side where there's less resistance uh, to, um, to mixing. Yeah. That, that seemed to work very well for the, uh, the craft brewery in Oregon that uh, had experienced the problem that's right. mentioned in the article. Right. Right. Yeah. So what's our, what's our takeaway from this? Well, if you're doing multiple fills and experience sluggish fermentations, mm -hmm. then you're probably experiencing stratification. Mm -hmm. And once you understand that, realize that there is this cascading effect on your yeast health for subsequent brews. Um, so if, uh, if you are experiencing stratification, then figure out a way to mix and mix well, and that should, should cure it. Right. Uh, I'm, you know, uh, how many others of, of these, these fascinating topics are out there that uh, could, could be helping a lot of craft brewers? Oh, probably, it's probably hundreds. I, hundreds, if not thousands. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, you know, who is very helpful for uh, craft brewers, home brewers up in the Reno area is my friends at Brew Chatter. Uh, yes. Me and Josh, uh, wonderful folks. Uh, they've got a, a great shop there, a uh, great online experience as well. Wonderful people, uh, kind and generous and knowledgeable. Uh, go check them out next time you're up near Reno or they're in, they're in Sparks, uh, just, just uh, uh, Reno adjacent. Uh, it's, okay. it's part of the Reno metro area. Um, right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they got a great place. They even got a little bar in there. It's lots of fun to visit. Uh, go check them out at brewchatter.com. All right, uh, let's take uh, one last break and then we'll come back. Uh, we've got some listener questions and uh, stuff like that right after this. All right, we're back. Uh, let's see here. Um, questions. Uh, do, do we, do we have a question. Uh, okay. William uh, was asking, he says, my anvil foundry is arriving tomorrow. Oh. Should its first brew be a hazy, a black IPA, or a Rauch beer? Oh, oh, that's a that's a tough question. Yeah, the, the, the question I need I need some additional information though before I can before I can give a true answer. Okay. Yeah. Well, are we invited to come and drink the beer? That's the question. <laughs> that's right. So then we're going to choose which one we want to drink. Right. Otherwise, maybe it's what you would like to drink, William. I was going to vote for the black IPA myself. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I would, I, I would go for the black IPA, but we just brewed one, uh, and uh, some a little black IPA out. Um, sure. I haven't had a Ralph beer in a long time. Yeah, that's, that's one that I haven't. Uh, I haven't had, well, no, actually, <laughs> I had um, somebody, somebody brought a bunch of bottles uh, uh, from Germany. Uh, hazy, I have, you know, pretty much every day. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Good question. I would, you know, hmm, hmm. that is very, that is a very tough question. I think um, maybe you, uh, just have a massive brewing session and you brew all three. That's one idea. I was going to, I was going to say I would have warned against the hazy just until he gets experiences the mash and recirculation in the anvil with the higher adjunct levels of a hazy. Right. Cause Could it's be a lot of oats, a lot of, a lot of wheat. Yeah. 
Right. It could be, I mean, I, I, I've done a hazy in my own anvil, um, worked fine. Um, but on the other hand, that particular batch was not recirculated. It was simply um, a, a one step, no sparge, drain mm -hmm. and boil. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked quite well. But uh, if you're going to be recirculating, then you may, you may want to try a, a batch that flows a little easier, like the Rausch beer or the Black IPA, just to get a feel for the system first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. Right. Uh, what, tell me about the Anvil Foundry. I mean, sure. is, is that, uh, I'm not familiar with it, is that uh, a kettle? Is that a whole brew system? What? It's, it's one of these all-in-one brew systems, very similar to the original Grainfather. Mm. Um, the Grainfather um, is a nice system. I brewed on that. Um, it has an internal pump that does the recirculation, whereas the Anvil uses an external pump um, that sits outside. And my first thought when I saw that was, oh, you know, it'd be slicker if it was inside like the Grainfather. Yeah, but, I like external. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> if an external pump clogs, it's yeah. very easy it's to external. Yeah. Take it apart, clear it, put mm -hmm. it back and start over. Mm -hmm. When it's internal, you got to dump the batch, which is a real pain in the butt. Right. So um yeah, the anvil's a nice all in one. It can run on one twenty or two twenty. Mm -hmm. Um just flip a switch, um, change the plug if you have to. Um, I have the smaller three gallon system or sorry, it's a five gallon vessel that mm -hmm. can be used to brew three gallon batches. Mm -hmm. And that works just great on standard, you know, 120 household, mm -hmm. um, reaches a boil in 20 minutes. Works great mm -hmm. for the, for the, for the larger 10 gallon vessel, I think it is to brew five gallon batches, um, you need the 220 to get a, a good vigorous boil out mm -hmm. of, you know, their six, seven gallons of wort. How many, how many amps of, uh, 15 amps, standard mm -hmm. 15 amp breaker, but you just need the higher voltage to run mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, beautifully designed system, really easy to use. Just, you know, punch a button to raise and lower the temperature. Um, yeah, really, really easy to brew on. And, what I was really, you know, I've, I've, I've like yourself, I've had, you know, um, three vessels, gravity fed systems, three vessel pumped systems, the Blickman top tier, uh, recirculation system and so on. And I love the anvil because there's so much less to clean up <laughs> at the end of the day. Right. It's just this one little vessel that you got to clean up versus three kettles and hoses and right, the right. heat exchange. You know, it's all that. It's like, wow, okay, this was, this was nice, nice, short, simple brew day. Well, and easier to store too, I would imagine. Yeah. The footprint of it. I mean, I, when I'm brewing on it, I do it downstairs in the garage on the washing machine. Um, mm. Just set it up there. Um, that way, if I spill wort, it's like, oh, it's, you know, it's the laundry room. <laughs> but uh, yeah, very nice system to brew on. I'm all excited because I'm getting a little uh, little five barrel brew plant uh, oh, here nice. for the brewery, which to me that seems so small now. You know, <laughs> back in the day, I would have thought five barrel. Oh, that's a pretty good size. Yeah, I think it's just it, it, to me, it's just like a little uh, little homebrew uh, size system to me now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all excited. It's coming. It's going to be uh, my my Christmas present. Uh, very it's nice. Like, uh, early December, we think. So uh, that should be that should be a lot of fun to set up. You'll have to come up and uh, brew with us. That's I would love to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what um, are you? How are you going to use that? Is it going to be for um, just week to week experimentation? Or yeah, yeah. Uh, be able to do uh, one thing is when you work in a brewery like this, there isn't a lot of opportunity for you to come up with your own crazy recipe you know, for a lot of these guys and they all right. want to be brewers. They're all interested in brewing. And, um, you know, we're, you know, we've got, you know, production to do and when yeah. it's a new recipe and a new, new, new beer, we're going to be doing generally I'm doing it because 
the thing is, it's it's, it's a minimum of like thirty five barrels. And it's like thirty five barrels of beer. You know, that's a big ask to get rid of thirty five yeah. barrels of beer if it doesn't quite work out. So I can't let people just go crazy. I try and right. work in their their stuff. Uh, this will allow them to do a lot more because five barrels, I can get rid of five barrels in the tap room, no problem. Yeah. And if it doesn't turn out well, it's much cheaper to, to dump. And then there's certain beers that I just love, like an ordinary bitter. Oh, and, yeah. You no, know, we've brewed 35 barrels of ordinary bitter before. And, you know, it goes okay, but it, we end up dumping some at the end, you know. Where, yeah. Whereas if I brew five barrels, it's like, that's perfect. You know, yeah. just, just enough for me to drink. And then, you know, and then we'll brew more. Uh, let's see. Todd is asking, uh, would an inline aeration mix work in the tank as the air rises inside, even after long turn times? Uh, so on the multi-batch, uh, a question actually about uh, what we're talking about. Yes and no. So, um, you know, the rising of aeration, generally the purpose of aeration is to get everything absorbed into the, the work. So a lot of times you're adding oxygen and you're not, you're, you're waiting to see no bubbles at the end uh, before it goes into the tank. Um, and a, a lot of times people aren't adding additional air when they add additional work. Uh, to a, to a multi-batch tank. So uh, you could do that. You could probably even mix in CO2. You could do anything to kind of stir it up, but you need to be kind of violent. We've tried stirring tanks with, with CO2 before and with oxygen, and it really, um, it will do an okay job, but it really doesn't do a great job of mixing a tank. We found a lot of um, same problem uh, adding water to a tank. We, we've done uh, oh. added water to a tank, and you know unless you pump that thing around, there's it is not mixed. You can try bubbling CO2 through it, not going to work. Uh, you have to pump it around. You have to use a pump. Um, so that's that's part of the problem with that. Uh, Jonathan asks, at what point will thermal difference overcome specific gravity difference to break up stratification in a standard conical? Like not chilling the second batch as much and using thermal lift to mix the two batches. So uh, go in warmer on the second batch. Uh, would that help mix the two? It would, yeah, it would decrease the potential, you know, temperature density gradient between the two words. Mm -hmm. um that would be a, a help probably um hard to say you know where you know what kind of uh number to attach to that and at what point you know where that trade-off occurs between density and temperature um that would encourage mixing versus prevent mixing um because there are several other factors you know fermenter geometry for example and the way and the, the flow velocity and such that are going to also contribute to that a mix and not mix. Um, well, and vision. you know, your, your gravity is already dropped uh, due to fermentation. I mean, it depends at, at what point. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Great question. It's the kind of thing that needs to be addressed at individual breweries. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right. Uh, great show. Great topic. Uh, if you're listening live, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Uh, we may get up and, and run to, to the little boy's room, but uh, we'll be right back. And then we've got a show coming up for you about uh, barrel aging based off of questions that have been sent in uh, to the Brewing Network. So uh, until then, which is in like three minutes, uh, brew strong, everyone. <laughs>